Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I'm not used to uh, speaking into a mic. So it's a bit strange uh, at the beginning. Uh, so welcome to this session. And it's my pleasure to be uh, here with you tonight. Uh, I was asked uh, to bring you some troubleshooting cases uh, of ICDs and uh, CRTDs. So there will be some uh, cases both uh, from uh, transvenous uh, ICDs and SICD and also from CRT. Uh, <clears throat> the devices. Uh, so my name is uh, Mihai Schubkegel, uh, and I'm the CRM training and education manager of uh, Boston Scientific in the gross emerging markets. This is an internal geography that starts from Far East Russia and ends in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. So it's a huge uh, region within the company. And I'm responsible for CRM, and I'm coming from Hungary, uh, from Budapest. Uh, so I would like to make uh, this session a little bit interactive, if possible. I saw that many people left. I hope it's not because they are afraid of me, because <laughs> I'm more excited than you, probably. Uh, so I would like to ask you to be interactive, if, if possible, because I'm not sure if I can speak for 90 minutes. Uh, so let's see uh, what we have today. So in the first presentation, I will uh, show you some uh, techie device uh, cases, and we will have to find uh, the solution uh, to each of them. And of course, please feel free to stop me at any time uh, if you have any questions or comments. Sorry, I have to step here because I cannot see from there. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a quick summary uh, of the markers that you can see in uh, Boston devices, uh, just to go through them quickly. So uh, these are the atrial uh, markers that you can see in the, uh, on the atrial channel. Uh, so they stand for atrial sense, refractory sense, blank sense, and paced uh, events. Uh, similarly for the ventricular events. Then in our devices, the ventricular zones are called VT minus one, VT and VF zones uh, coming from the slowest to the fastest zone. Then if you see a V episode or V detect marker, these uh, stand for ventricular episode start and that detection criteria met. Uh, v dur stands for ventricular detection duration completed. Uh, then uh, these are, I think, quite obvious. So these are gradual and sudden. These are all important because you will see these markers on the next slide. So that's why uh, I wanted to give you just a quick summary. Uh, stable uh, and unstable markers will also be visible uh, on the strips. And AFib stands for atrial fibrillation. Uh, v greater than A is the next one. And in the last row, you can see the red ID markers. Uh, and if you see a C, that means correlated. If you see a U, that means uncorrelated. And you can see a percentage. Uh, yeah, so that's all about the markers. And here's the first uh, case that I brought to you. So uh, this is uh, the, oh, sorry. I hope you didn't see the answer. Uh, so this is the first case uh, about an unwanted shock. So here you can see some solutions, uh, which behavior can be observed here. So please look at the strip. Uh, can you read the markers in the back? I'm not sure if you can. Can you read the markers or do you need any help? Is it legible? Okay, thank you. So is there any volunteer who would make a guess uh, what it could be? What can you see on the strip? Thank you very much. Any other comments or any other guesses? Of course, you can all make your guess uh, by the numbers, and then you will see if you were right or not. So if there are no other uh, comments, then let's see uh, in more details what you have to observe on the strip. So the first one is here, uh, marked by blue color. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so here you can see some noise uh, signals, and these are annotated by VN, which stands for ventricular noise at the beginning. And with, with the green light, you can see that uh, VF detection uh, was uh, happening uh, in the VF zone. So that's why you see VF markers. Then after that, as uh, you said uh, correctly, uh, there is an appropriate shock delivery. 
uh, because you can see that the device uh, started uh, charging or finished uh, charging here and the shock was delivered. And you can see uh, that there is also post shock pacing uh, after the shock was delivered. So indeed, it was an appropriate and expected uh, ICD behavior, although uh, the ventricular noise was due to a, uh, the patient or the person who tried to electrocute himself. So that's why you can see this noise at the beginning. So therefore it was an unwanted uh, shock, obviously, but otherwise from the device perspective, it was an appropriate, uh, and, uh, appropriate and expected uh, shock. So let's see the next one, uh, quiz number two. So which behavior can be observed uh, here? Is it an intermittent atrial undersensing, supraventricular tachycardia, normal ICD behavior with successful ATP, or pacemaker mediated tachycardia, or non sustained VT? Any volunteer or any guess? I give you some time, of course, because it's probably not that easy for the first sight. Trial of overdrive suppression. Okay, we will see. Any other? Okay, second guess, any other? Okay, if no more guesses, then I show you the, the answer. So this is a normal ICD behavior with successful ATP. And let's see it in, uh, let's see it uh, step by step. So here you can see in the beginning circled by blue, uh, the declaration of the ventricular episode. In our devices, uh, for, de for the device to declare a ventricular episode, it needs to see eight out of 10 cycles in the actual VT zone, which can be, as I said before, VT minus one, VT or VF uh, zone. Uh, so the device has to see uh, eight out of 10 cycles. So that was fulfilled here. So that's why you see the marker V episode. That means the declaration of the ventricular episode. After that, you see the green arrow, which represents the rate duration. In this example, it is one second. And during the rate duration, the device is using the six out of 10 counter. So during this time, the device uh, uh, still has to see six out of 10 intervals to be falling in the actual zone in order to fulfill uh, the duration. Once the duration is, uh, is, uh, once the duration is uh, fulfilled, then uh, the therapy uh, will be delivered. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the rhythm was classified as stable and V greater than A. I'm not sure if it's visible from the back, but here it says V greater than A. So as you can see, because here, if you look at the channels, you can see that this is the atrial, the first one, the atrial channel, then the right ventricle and the left ventricular uh, channel. Uh, sorry, I cannot see on the big screen. Uh, yeah, so the first one is the the uh, the atrial uh, the atrial channel, uh, then the ventricular EGM and the shock EGM. So you can see that uh, it says that uh, the ventricular rate was bigger than the atrial rate. So for the device, it means it's uh, the arrhythmia is coming from the ventricle, so it has to be treated. And also the device see that it was stable. So for the device, a stable arrhythmia means. Uh, uh, an arrhythmia coming from the ventricle. So therefore, uh, the programmed uh, therapy was delivered, which was an ATP. So you can see that the ATP burst was delivered here and the VT was terminated. Does it make sense? Thank you. So let's see the next one. Again, please look at the details of the whole strip and we would like to know which of the following statements is true. The first one is therapy inhibited due to stable atrial rate or therapy inhibited due to stable ventricular rate, therapy inhibited due to AV synchrony, therapy inhibited due to gradual onset, therapy inhibited due to slow VT in VT minus one zone without program therapy, also known as, as a monitor only therapy. Of course, take your time because it needs some analysis.
anybody has any guess? This yes, is please, st please. stable sinus tachycardia. Okay. So there is no need for any shock. So what would be your choice out of the number five? one? Sorry? Number one. Number one. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, can I uh, see? I'm Dr. Lamia. Yes. I'm online. Five. Hello. Okay, let's see. Can I move on or you want to make more guesses? Uh, due to gradual onset. So let's see in more details. So those were right who said it's number four. I think nobody said number four. <laughs> uh, so therapy in hip. I'm sorry. I have pushed the wrong button, I think. Yeah. So therapy inhibited due to gradual onset is the right answer. And why? Let's see. So the first observation uh, should be uh, that, uh, marked by uh, blue color. Uh, the detection enhancement is set to onset stability. You can read it here. You can read it here. Then if you look at the green color, uh, you can see that uh, you see the marker V episode. It, it again means that uh, the episode, uh, ventricular episode uh, was declared. But you also see a marker below that, which says gradual. So it was a gradual onset uh, ventricular episode. Then if you look at the, I think it's brown or red, reddish, uh, here it says uh, V duration. So it means that the duration has elapsed. So it completed the ventricular duration. But you see that there is no therapy afterwards. And why? Uh, because it was a gradual onset and stable rate. So because of the discriminational algorithms, which is called OBDE or one button detection enhancement in our devices, it was set to onset and stability. And it was a gradual onset. So for the device, it, uh, it means a non-treatable or a, an episode that shouldn't be treated because it was a gradual. So most likely it was coming from the supraventricular uh, space. Yes, because Marker is VT. detected as VT. Yes, that's correct. But therapy was it enters into the Yeah, so indeed, uh, that's the right observation. So it's a uh, it's in the VT zone, so the, the rhythm falls into the VT zone, but uh, the therapy is, with, is with, uh, withheld. So uh, after the duration, uh, if it was, uh, if it was a, a real uh, VT, then uh, the device should treat it. But because of uh, the gradual onset, as a discrimination algorithm, the onset stability algorithm was uh, selected, and it was a, a gradual onset arrhythmia. So for the device, it means that it shouldn't treat uh, because it's uh, most, it's not like a, a real VT, which comes from the ventricle, and uh, it usually has a sudden onset. Does that make sense? Or... So here you can see a, a therapy, inhibited therapy. Due to... While there is no VA discussion, you have an atrial, you have an atrial lead there. And there is no VA dissociation. The atrial rate equals the ventricular rate. So why the device detected as VT? Uh, because the, 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 the speed of the arrhythmia uh, or the frequency of the arrhythmia was fulfilling the VT zone border. So uh, the, the rhythm was falling into the VT zone that was set in the device. I'm not sure if it's, no, we cannot see it on the, on the slide. So I don't know the, the exact values, but it was falling into the VT zone. So that's why it was classified as a VT. So if I, I become... understand that that when the rate when the rate exceeds the VT zone, it will be recognized as VT. Then one of the uh, differentiation is the VA dissociation. Yes, so, so I think the, the the device will label it VT as long as it's numerically in the VT zone. Yes. And then it will look at the discriminators, the onset and stability. Because here it says it recognizes it as a VT event, but then it, as, when it looked at the stability and the onset, 
it says that the event ended and it lasted for 31 seconds. I think this is how it works. Yeah, so the, the, this, I was too loud. Uh, so the discrimination algorithms work only in the VT minus one and VT zones. So if the frequency reaches the VT zone, for example, then it will be classified as a VT. So here you can see that the device already noticed that it's a VT episode uh, going on. But uh, as, as you said before, uh, we have the discrimination algorithms because of course we don't want to treat something that doesn't need to be treated. So the device is using these algorithms and uh, the uh, gradual onset was fulfilled here. So for the device, it means that it's not coming from the ventricle, although it's falling into the VT zone. Yes. Uh, do we have an end for this episode? I think. Uh, no, unfortunately, this is okay. only. My uh, question is uh, also linked to Dr. Hatim question. During interrogation of the device, some some of uh, some some of us may not enter every episode. So these episodes will be marked in the diagnostics as VT episodes. Why it's not marked as ventricular high rate episodes to differentiate it from ventricular tachycardia? Because if you didn't open all these episodes, you might treat your patient with aggressive antiarrhythmics or something, uh, putting in your mind that he has frequent ventricular tachycardia episodes. So uh, why it is labeled as ventricular tachycardia and not a ventricular high rate episode? Uh, I don't know the right answer. Uh, my guess would be that uh, it's classified as a VT because it reached uh, the VT zone borders. So for the device, uh, it's a VT episode then. It was just uh, uh, a non-treated uh, VT episode. So for such episodes, uh, the device cannot store everything because of the limited memory. So there's a hierarchy. And it's a very complex uh, algorithm that uh, decides uh, what episodes to be stored in the memory and what uh, to delete. So there are uh, hierarchies. So for example, a VF episode is never deleted uh, unless there are many uh, and uh, the device needs more memory. So some episodes are overwritten with, with a higher priority episodes. So that may, uh, may be a reason why you don't find something or not every episode has an EGM, again, because of the limited memory in the device. So not everything can be stored. So in order to differentiate the true ventricular tachycardia, from the uh, other tachycardias, like this uh, supraventricular tachycardia, you have to enter every episode. Uh, yeah, you have, to, you, you have to look into the details. Yeah. But the good thing in our devices, I don't know if you know that, but uh, in all uh, Boston devices, the onset EGM is always turned on, not like with other uh, competitors' devices. So for you, if you want to analyze something, you, you will always have information prior to the event, so you can see the whole event and not just uh, a part of it. Does it does it show the reason why they didn't give the um, let's see. So the question is, and I think it's a very good question. We're lucky that we have an EGM for this case. Let's say, yeah, we have hundred episodes like this one, therefore the, the device would not store all of them and we'll see only 10. The other 90, let's say the other 90, or actually the device was behaving exactly like this. What would the device show us? Would it show us that these were 90 VT episodes or would it show us that these were 90 VT episodes that were not treated because of, of, of uh, slow onset? Does it, does it tell you does it tell us the reason uh, of uh, of not giving the uh, yeah? So if, I have to admit that uh, uh, I'm not seeing transvenous uh, transvenous devices recently, so I can only rely on my old memory. Uh, so if you go into the arrhythmia logbook on the programmer screen, there you have uh, all the episodes that are stored either with EGM or without EGM in the device memory. So uh, the, the basic information can be found there, even if uh, you don't have EGM, but you won't have all these details, of course. So uh, as I can remember, uh, there are no explanations. So you just see, see if it was a treated or an untreated episode. And if it was treated, you see if there were ATPs, uh, shocks delivered uh, with how many joules and uh, things like that. But, but more details are, cannot be stored, unfortunately. And it's not, not just in a Boston device, but I think in other devices as well, because uh, these have limited memory. <laughs> 
So going back to this slide, uh, so you can see here as an explanation. So therapy was not delivered in this case, although the rhythm entered uh, the VT zone, uh, but uh, the discrimination algorithms uh, were working and uh, were with, uh, holding uh, the therapy because of the gradual onset and the stable rate. And also that, uh, also because uh, the atrial sense uh, was uh, uh, below uh, the atrial fibrillation threshold and uh, ventricular uh, rate greater than atrial rate was not fulfilled. Just for information, I think it will be mentioned on the next slide that uh, the V greater than A uh, algorithm or feature is override, overriding uh, the inhibition, uh, inhibition algorithms. So just a quick summary uh, about the, the things that I partially mentioned already. So this is what you can get uh, if you program the onset stability. We call it one button detection enhancement because with only one button programming, you can get all these, all these uh, parameters that are listed here uh, as a discrimination algorithm that again, only working in the VT minus one and VT uh, zones. So those are the following. Uh, the onset, the stability, the ventricular rate uh, is greater than atrial rate. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's an inhibitor override. So if the device sees that the ventricular rate is greater than atrial uh, rate and all the other algorithms say that uh, therapy should be withheld, this will override. So it will deliver therapy because if ventricular rate is greater than atrial rate, then there's a high chance that it's a real ventricular uh, tachycardia. You can also program uh, the atrial fib rate threshold and the sustained rate duration or SRD. Uh, does any of you have any bad experience with SRD? Have you ever had a patient who had some issues because of that? I'm happy that nobody says yes, but uh, in, in other countries, uh, we often hear the complaints uh, that uh, it sometimes creates some issues. So it's very important to know that uh, if sustained rate duration is programmed on, you can program it, it, program it on in, uh, in time, so seconds and minutes. It means that after this uh, period of time, the device will no longer withhold the therapy, but will deliver the therapy. So it's only... Uh, feasible for some of your patients, for example, those who are uh, doing uh, regular physical uh, activities and they develop some uh, arrhythmia uh, during, uh, the, during the physical activity. And you should always program it according to their uh, physical activities that they usually do. So for example, if they always go for cycling for 20 minutes, then you shouldn't program it for less than 20 minutes because it means that uh, after 10, 15, whatever minutes, the device will deliver the therapy. So if the patient is always exercising for 20 minutes, as an example, you should program it to, let's say, 25 minutes. Then if the arrhythmia is still uh, ongoing or the fast rhythm is still ongoing and the, the patient cannot tolerate, then the device will go for therapy. Otherwise, our recommendation for most of the patients uh, to please uh, program it to off. Uh, it's nominally on in the devices, but uh, it's a good practice to program it to off unless it's needed in, in those special cases. So going back to onset and stability. So in case of onset, if there is a sudden onset, that for the device means it's a VF, VT, AT, or AF because there is a sudden uh, increase in the heart rate. If it's gradual, uh, then it means for the device, it's a sinus uh, tachycardia. You can see here uh, that it gradually, uh, the heart rate gradually increases. If it comes to stability, if the rhythm is stable, that for the device means it's either a monomorphic VT, uh, sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia. If it's unstable, like you can see here, it's, uh, it means for the device, if uh, it's either a VF, polymorphic VT or AF. So the next example, uh, quiz number four. So you can see a strip again, and uh, we have to find the answer to the following question. Which of the following statements is true? 
is it a therapy inhibited due to stable atrial rate or is it the therapy inhibited uh, due to stable ventricular rate therapy inhibited due to mode switch therapy inhibited due to gradual onset or therapy inhibited due to being declared as SVT by morphological criteria. I heard number five. 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 Okay. Everybody says five. Okay. So then I think we can go to the next slide and let's see the, the right answer. And yes, you were right. Uh, so this uh, is a therapy inhibited due to morphologic criteria. And let's see why. So here you can see uh, with blue, it's circled by blue, that the detection uh, enhancement or the discrimination algorithm in this example was a rhythm ID. Are you familiar with our rhythm ID algorithm? So it's a kind of morphology-based uh, discrimination algorithm. Other companies also have something similar. Uh, in our devices, it's called the rhythm ID. <clears throat> so you can see that uh, that was programmed in, in this uh, example. Then you can also observe here, uh, circled by green, uh, that the ventricular episode was declared by the device because there were enough uh, uh, high frequency ventricular uh, um, intervals. Uh, if you recall you know, from the beginning, the device has to see eight out of 10 uh, fast beats uh, to declare the episode. <clears throat> so this was done by the device. Then with purple, you can see that the atrial rate was above the programmed AFib threshold because these are annotated here as AFib. Is it visible from there? Can you see the, the markers? Because for me, it's difficult to see, but uh, uh, with purple, if you believe me, uh, there you can see AFib, AFib, AFib uh, markers under the, uh, the, um, the events. So atrial rate was above uh, the programmed if uh, free uh, threshold. So therefore the device uh, marked uh, them as AFib. And you can see here with brown that the rhythm was classified as stable here with 95, uh, 96 to 97% uh, correlation. So this refers, to, this, this refers to the rhythm ID algorithm where the rhythm ID algorithm compares the stored template to the actual uh, ventricular event. It compares uh, along several points and makes a percentage, uh, a correlation percentage. Uh, the nominal value is 94%. It can be changed if needed, uh, but in most cases it's 94. So if, a, if a, the device sees that the correlation is above 94%, it uh, thinks that it's correlated. So uh, it's uh, very similar to the stored uh, normal sinus rhythm template. If it's less correlated or uncorrelated below 94%, you would see a U letter and the percentage. So in this case, uh, the therapy was inhibited because there was high percentage correlation, 96, 97%. So for the device, it means that it shouldn't treat because it's very similar to the stored normal sinus rhythm template. Because as a physician, each physician has to see to the uh, tracing itself because this and the previous one was not actually a VT. Yeah. I didn't get the question. I, I mean that as physicians, this is detected by the machine as VT, as the previous uh, tracing, but actually the tracings are not VT. Yeah, not and real are VT, not, but the... And are not also an AF. So as a physician, you have to see the tracing itself and do not depend on what was written below because it is not a VT and it is not an atrial fibrillation. This is according to the program of the IC. 
Am I yeah, right? it's a good point. So you, it's if available, you should always look at the EGM because th this is why we have these cases. Uh, because when I, when I observed many, many of the ICDs tracing, it actually correct. When it say VT, it is VT. When it writes AF, it is atrial fibrillation. So why it wrongly, it wrongly written AF, but it is not an AF. VT, it is not an AVT. Yeah, so again, it's annotated as VT because uh, the rhythm is reaching the VT zone. So the device but, can only see but, the, but the for, rate. For physicians who cannot see the tracing, you will say this is VT or this is an AF, and you can respond by giving amiodarone, for example, or rate slowing like uh, digoxin or beta blocker to control the AF rate. But this is not neither an AF nor a VT. This is slide and the one, the previous one as well. Yeah, so that's a good point. So you also always have to look into the details, otherwise you don't know what happened exactly. And again, uh, these are just small examples. Uh, I don't have all the settings. So of course you have to evaluate everything together because maybe uh, the, in this patient, the, you know, the settings were not correctly done. So that can also be the case. So I, I don't know the, the, the rest of the, the details. So these are just the uh, EGM examples. Uh, from this. Is there any other questions regarding this or shall we advance? Did it make sense or was it uh, understandable? So this was a, again an inhibited therapy due to uh, the discrimination algorithms. And in this case, uh, it was not onset. So in our devices, you can either select onset stability or rhythm ID. The two cannot work together. And in this case, uh, the rhythm ID, uh, the so-called morphology-based uh, discrimination algorithm was uh, selected. And here's just a, a quick summary about how our rhythm ID uh, algorithm works. So I told you that it's a kind of morphology uh, discriminational algorithm, because in reality, it's a vector, it's a so-called vector timing and correlation algorithm. So you can see that the device, uh, maybe it's not very visible here, but uh, the device stores a normal sinus rhythm template. It can, uh, the device can autom uh, automatically update uh, regularly uh, this uh, template, but you can also do that manually on the programmer. So there's a, a template uh, stored in the device, and whenever uh, uh, an unknown rhythm comes, it will compare to the stored template in a way that it uh, aligns uh, the peaks of uh, the template, uh, the template and the actual unknown rhythm, and it will check on different points uh, the correlation between the template and the actual rhythm. And if the device sees that the correlation is more than 94%, it means that the unknown beat is correlated, so it indicate, indicates an SVT. If the correlation is less or equal to 94, but again, I told you that this percentage can be changed, but it's a nominal setting, so for most of the patients, uh, this should work uh, properly. So if the correlation is less than 94%, then the unknown beat is uncorrelated. So for the device, it means it's a VT. And the unknown rhythm is uh, uh, correlated and means inhibit therapy if at least three of the last 10 beats meet the percentage match threshold. So this is how the rhythm ID algorithm works in our devices. And these are, the, uh, these are the two decision trees that our devices are using. On the left-hand side, you can see a single chamber ICD. On the right-hand side, a dual chamber ICD. So you can see here how the decision is made by the device. So let's start with the single chamber ICD. There is an unknown rhythm detected in, as an example, in the, in the VT minus one or the VT zone. Then the device will check whether the vector timing correlation is satisfied or not. If the correlation is satisfied, then the device, for the device, it means it's a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, if there is no correlation, it means a ventricular tachycardia for the device. 
In case of a dual chamber ICD, there is an unknown rhythm that falls uh, into the VT minus one or VT zone. Then the, dev the device will look uh, in the next uh, step if uh, the ventricular rate is greater than the atrial rate by at least 10 beats per minute or more. If the answer is yes, then it's a VT for the device. If the answer is no, so the ventricular rate is not greater than the A rate, then the vector timing uh, correlation algorithm is used. And if the device sees correlation, then it means SVT for the device uh, decision. Uh, if it's not correlated, then the device will check if the atrial rate is above the atrial fibrillation threshold rate. And if the ventricular rate is unstable, if the answer is no, then it's a VT for the device. If the answer is yes, then it's an SVT. And again, therapy will be with other. Any questions to this? Okay, then let's see the next uh, example. Is it familiar to anybody, uh, the picture? I'm asking because it's not a transvenous device, it's uh, an SICD. Does any of you have any experience with SICD? Okay, so I hope you will find them interesting uh, because the next few examples are from uh, SICD uh, patients. So, this slide disappeared. Yeah, thank you. So you can, so this is how an SICD report, an episode report uh, looks like. And uh, without knowing uh, all the details or the operation of the SICD, what would be your guess? Which behavior can be observed here? First, uh, first option is inappropriate shock due to T wave oversensing, or inappropriate shock due to supraventricular tachycardia, or fast VT with appropriate shock delivery, or VF with appropriate shock delivery, or fast VT with appropriate ATP delivery. Number three. Number three, which is fast VT with appropriate shock delivery. Any other guess? Okay, so let's see what is the right answer. Indeed, uh, those who said three, they were right. So this is a fast VT with appropriate shock delivery. And let's see it in details. Uh, and for the SICD, just uh, very quickly, uh, you have to know the, the, mark, the markers. So in an SICD report, you may see the following markers. So S stands for a sensed beat, P stands for a paced event, N for noise, T for tacky or treatable detection, uh, a C indicates a charge start, E indicates a charge end, a uh, black dot is a discarded beat, and the little heart is uh, the end of an event. <clears throat> By the way, I have to uh, tell you that it's a little bit different what you can see in a, in a regular report from an SICD because this report is taken from our latitude uh, system. Do you know what our latitude system is? It's our remote patient monitoring system. So the SICD is also compatible with this uh, system. So these uh, tracings are not taken from the programmer, but from the internet, from the cloud, from the uh, remote uh, system. There are slight uh, differences, but you can find the same information in, in them. So what we can see here, the, in the first step, you can see uh, it's in a blue box, uh, if we see the color from the back. So in the first part, you can see that initially there is a sinus rhythm uh, with some PVCs. You can see some PVCs there. And after that, uh, in the brown uh, box, you can see uh, the onset uh, of a fast VT with appropriate de detection. So you can see that the uh, device is detecting uh, the beats as tacky beats or treatable beats. So that you see the T, T markers uh, until, uh, so you can see then uh, with purple that uh, a C letter C. So that means the device started to charge because the de detection criteria were fulfilled here. So the device started charging and the arrhythmia is still ongoing. So then the device uh, finished, the device uh, started uh, the charging of the capacitor 
and the arrhythmia was still there, so the device delivered uh, the uh, the high energy shock. So this was an appropriate and successful shock delivery, as you can see, because uh, sinus rhythm with some PVCs uh, came back. So the fast VT was terminated. Any questions or comments? So the SICD can deliver antipathy basin also? It's a very good question. And uh, the answer was just to, to, to fool the audience because it cannot, it cannot deliver. <laughs> so just to make it more complex. Why do, have, why do you have a marker for pace? Yes, because the SICD can deliver a post-shock pacing, but only post-shock pacing for up to 30 seconds after a shock delivered. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but it's a, it's really a very very good question because uh, uh, just for your information, uh, we will come hopefully soon to the market with our leadless pacemaker, which is called the Empower. So the the clinical trial, the the inhuman clinical trial is is already recruiting uh, patients in which they implant uh, an SICD together with the Empower, the leadless pacemaker. And the nice thing is that uh, uh, with this you can you can have a modular CRM approach. And uh, for example, if you implant an SICD today, but your patient will develop, uh, develop pacing need in five years, 10 years, then you can simply add a leadless pacemaker and the two devices will be able to communicate with each other. And then uh, the Empower pacemaker will be able to deliver even ATP uh, on the demand or on the order of the SICD. And we'll of course also pace, uh, we'll be able to pace if needed. Yeah. I have a question, please. Uh, what are the main discriminators for the SICD for detection or confirmation? The discriminators? Of the yes. Uh, for the slide, I, I will show you. Okay. Because I can see here that the first few bits have been detected as sensitive bits, not uh, annotated as tachycardia bits. Yeah. So one thing that you need to know uh, <clears throat> about the SICD, that the SICD is not... Uh, not marking the intervals on an on a beat to beat basis, but the SICD is always looking at the average of the last four uh, RR intervals, and based on that, we'll uh, annotate uh, the beats. So it needs some time until the average of the four last RR interval uh, falls into the uh, the detection zone. <laughs> so that's why uh, there may be some uh, delay uh, with the markers. So uh, here's the answer to your question. <clears throat> so of course it's much more complex, but we don't have time today uh, for that. Just a very quick summary how the SICD uh, is operating and how it makes uh, the decisions. So the SICD <clears throat> algorithm, which is called uh, the insight algorithm, it has uh, three phases. In the first phase, uh, the device needs to detect uh, the signals. And as you can see here on the example, the SECG signal is very similar to a surface ECG uh, compared to an intracardiac signal. So first, the SICD has to detect. Then in the second phase, the, the SICD will certify uh, the heart rate. Uh, it will determine what heart rate is seen. And there are four uh, different double detection algorithms working at the same time. And these are designed uh, to reduce oversensing. In the third phase, uh, the heart rate is assessed and therapy is confirmed. And then if the decision was made by the device, then of course therapy will be delivered. And in this phase, there are three uh, rhythm discriminators uh, are working at the same time to confirm whether the device should deliver therapy or shouldn't deliver uh, therapy. So this is really just in a very small nutshell because it's, it's a very complex so the, in general, I heard some comments from customers that it's a very simple device. Yes, it's very simple to use and very simple to program, but it has very complicated, very complex algorithms working in the background. S sub 10. Anyone like to know? S means subcutaneous. Yes, S means subcutaneous. Although I have to tell you that now we have almost 20 years of clinical experience with the SICD. So in the beginning, Sorry, uh, it was developed in a way that uh, it would be implanted just under the skin, 
But over the past years, we learned from clinical practice, uh, we have more than 110,000 patients implanted worldwide uh, with SICD. So in many countries, it's now it's the, the number one device uh, when it comes to, to tech, tech devices. So the point is that we learned over the time that if uh, uh, the device is implanted just under the skin, it may create some issues later on, uh, some complications. So now the modern implant technique is to implant the device in a natural kind of natural pocket, a natural space, which is between two muscles, which are the musculus serratus anterior and musculus latissimus dorsi. So these are the two muscles and there's a natural space where you don't have any vessels, any nerves. So it's very nicely sitting into that pocket. There's no bleeding if you are in the right plane. And also it's very good, especially for skinny uh, patients that uh, the device is covered by muscle. So uh, when the patient doesn't have too much subcutaneous tissue, you don't have to be afraid of erosion, for example, which can be the case if you implant it just under the skin. So it's still called a subcutaneous ICD because it's still under the skin, but it's a little bit deeper nowadays uh, where we implant uh, the device. So the next example uh, is also from uh, SICD. So you can see that the, the tracing is uh, similar or at least the strip is, uh, looks uh, similar. Uh, so this is an emblem MRI SICD. That's the current generation, the latest generation. And uh, here the sensing vector is alternate. Just for your information, the SICD system can sense along three different vectors, which are the primary, secondary, and alternate vectors. I will show you on the next slide, which is which and how it works. But for you, now the question is, uh, which behavior can be observed here? Is it an appropriate shock due to fast VT? Is it an inappropriate shock due to SVT? Or is it an inappropriate shock due to T wave oversensing? Or is it an inappropriate shock due to EMI? EMI stands for electromagnetic interference. Or is it an inappropriate shock due to air entrapment in device header? I choose number four. Number four. Any other? Five. One, number one. Okay, so let's see. So the right answer is number five. Go ahead. So this is an inappropriate shock due to air entrapment in the device header. Uh, it's a very small thing, and uh, please keep in mind that it's also applicable to all transvenous devices, not, not just Boston, every company, every device. We always recommend that when you implant the lead and you connect the device, please, please first put the torque wrench or the screwdriver first in the header, then the lead. And it's applicable to every device, because if you do the other way around, then the air that is inside the header, when you push in the lead, it cannot come out from the header and it can create issues like this. So we quite often see, not just with the SICD, but also with the transvenous devices. So please remember screwdriver first, then lead, then fix uh, the lead. So let's see what we can see here and how you can figure out that it was, uh, or how it was figured out that it was due to air entrapment in the device header. So in brown boxes, you can see that sinus rhythm is visible throughout the whole episode. You can see that uh, everywhere you can see the sinus rhythm. So it suggests that it's not a kind of, it's not some kind of arrhythmia, but something else. And those of, those of you who said that it's uh, maybe EMI or something, they, they were also right because there is something uh, uh, that's not coming from the heart. And you can see, uh, or then you can observe in the in the in the red box that there is a sudden onset. There's a sudden onset of artifacts uh, with frequency slowing down over time. Maybe it's not that visible or not easy to uh, to observe, but it's slowing down over the time. Then you can see that the device uh, started uh, charging here. There's a C marker and uh, stopped uh, charging here then delivered the shock. So it was an inappropriate shock because it was all sinus rhythm uh, in the background all the time. So in this case, uh, as I told you, air was entrapped in the device header during implantation. 
and uh, it was escaping through the seal plug, but this caused this uh, noise uh, in, in, in the sensing. So, is an aircraft. I expected to see the whole things in the tracing like this. So why didn't permit? Maybe because the patient was moving, there was some movement, and uh, you know the lead was uh, moving, so air was uh, around uh, the the connector part in the header. So that that may be the cause. And uh, uh, you can nicely see that uh, after the shock was delivered, uh, you don't see the the same thing anymore. It's most likely because there was a big movement by the patient, so the air went somewhere away uh, in the header but it may come back again later on if the air uh, stays there. Sorry? What? Uh, well, it's a, uh, this, is a, uh, this was a case uh, um, investigated by our tech service. So they are much smarter than us. And uh, they know, I think uh, it has a special pattern that they already know. So they uh, know but also EMI, I think uh, that has higher frequency uh, than this usually. So that's more, more frequent and uh, sharper uh, than this in, if you look at the morphology. So I think this is typical to, to this uh, phenomenon. So that's why they knew it was because of that. This patient working for asymptomatic during the presentation. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was symptomatic because uh, he or she got a shock and uh, without any good reason. So that was a uh, for sure that was a complaint uh, from the patient because uh, the patient was I don't know the the other any other details, but uh, the patient must have been conscious. So if they get a shock, especially with the SICD, which can deliver 80 joules, uh, that's that would be for sure yeah. uh, i have no information about that but uh, i assume not because there was nothing uh, connected nothing related to the heart so as you can see uh, sinus normal sinus rhythm is is everywhere uh, in the background so this this is a noise it's a kind of noise that's coming uh, from the header because of the air that stayed in the header so I don't think the patient had any symptom because there was normal sinus rhythm. After the shock, yes, <laughs> of course. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, this was a, a misclassification as tachyarrhythmia, so that uh, that led to inappropriate shock. So I promised you that I will show you how the SICD system works. So you can see here that uh, the SICD is implanted on the left uh, side of the chest of the patient, and there is one, only one uh, electrode that is tunneled up along the sternum, along the mid uh, sternal line. And as I told you, the SICD can sense along three sensing vectors, which are the primary, which is between the, uh, the proximal sensing electrode and the CAN. Then the secondary is between the tip of the, the distal tip of the electrode and the can, and the alternate sensing vector is between the two sensing points on the electrode. So this is how the, the SICD uh, works in a nutshell, of course, because there are many more details uh, with that. And this is uh, for information, uh, this is called the sense B node or the proximal sensing ring. It will be important in a in the next slide. Uh, for you to remember. So here you can see another episode, uh, which also had air entrapment in the header. And here the sensing vector was uh, the secondary uh, vector. And you can see that uh, it was an untreated. So the device uh, started, uh, started charging already, but then therapy was not delivered because uh, then uh, the noise uh, disappeared, so the device didn't deliver a shock. Now let's see the next, uh, this is again uh, from an SICD. 
uh, here the sensing vector is uh, the primary and the question is which behavior can be observed here is it either an appropriate shock due to vf or is it an inappropriate shock due to air entrapment around the sifoidal ring electrode or sense, sense b node that i mentioned before the the proximal uh, sensing node or is it an appropriate behavior due to asystole? Or is it an inappropriate shock due to EMI? Or is it an inappropriate shock due to uh, loose set screw? Uh, number three. So three, four, five. Okay, let's see. So the right answer was number two. <laughs> It's an inappropriate shock due to air entrapment at sense B electrode. So again, sense B electrode is the one which is at the cipher process. So that's the proximal sensing electrode on the lead. So remember the device is on the left side of the patient. The electrode is tunneled up all the way along the sternum. There are two sensing points on the lead. One distal, that's uh, the sensing point A. And this is the sensing point B, which is at the cipher uh, incision. So here, uh, the air was not uh, entrapped in the header of the device, but around the sensing ring uh, on the electrode. And how can we identify that or how can we figure that out? So let's see the first step. Again, you can see like in the previous uh, example, although it's not as clearly visible in some places, but you can observe that sinus rhythm is visible during the whole episode. You can see the brown uh, boxes everywhere. Then you can see in the green uh, box that there is a sudden massive reduction or absence of SECG. So you can see the signals here, and then you can see that they disappear, disappear in, the, in, the, in the green box. And uh, that's because of, uh, because of the air around the sensing ring, because you know that the uh, air is a very good electrical insulator. So then uh, the device had uh, sensing issues. And uh, in, the, in the red or pink box, you can see that uh, the loss of signal leads to sensitivity increase because the device doesn't see the previous good or better signals. So it has to increase its sensitivity. And just for information, the SICD can become as sensitive as to 80 microvolts, not milli, microvolts. So it can be very, very sensitive. And this is what exactly happened here. So it's very typical to air entrapment uh, around the device or the lead because it's very nicely visible in most of the cases that uh, the amplitude of the signals are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking until a point that the SICD becomes very sensitive and starts uh, sensing myopotential or any other type of noise. Then if it delivers a shock, it's also very, typical that you see that the amplitude comes back immediately because it's a, it, it creates a big muscle contraction. So the air goes away uh, from the sensing part of the system. So it's a very typical picture that you can see. So here you can see that uh, the loss of signal uh, leads to sensitive, sensitivity increase and also baseline wandering. That's also a very typical part of the picture when there is air somewhere under the skin after the implant. Usually this happens right after the implant the same night. I also had some experiences from my own uh, experience when the patient got uh, a shock uh, the same night. So all these things can be avoided with proper implant techniques. So that's why it's very important to know about these because it's very important how the implant is done. So as you can see, the air was uh, entrapped uh, around, uh, around uh, the sense B node and uh, it was fluctuating around uh, the electrode. So that's uh, what caused uh, the inappropriate uh, shock. Yep. Around the device or at the patient? How does the device And how to avoid it? Very good question. So as I told you, it's very important to, to follow all the implant steps. So all these things can be avoided by a proper implant technique. So that's why it's very important if somebody starts implanting SICD 
to to go over a certain learning curve because it's quite different from a transvenous device. It's a different surgical approach. Uh, after the learning curve, it becomes very easy, uh, but you really have to follow the best practices. So there are many little steps that we learned over the time. So for example, when I started with SICD, supporting SICD implants in, I don't know, 2014, uh, we didn't do this step that I will describe now. So nowadays, when we close the pocket uh, of the device, we flush uh, with sterile uh, saline the pocket just to get rid of the air because we, we saw these cases. So we learned over time that it may happen. The same applies to the other incisions. So we flush, we recommend to flush all the incisions before closing uh, the layers. And if you do that properly, you can avoid all these complications. Uh, and back to your other question. So the device doesn't know where the air is. So this is a kind of oversensing. Uh, and it's because of the insulating air that insulates the electrical things around the sensing uh, points. So the device has to go more and more sensitive, but then it will pick up other uh, electrical activities or my potential or noise. Answer to this question, if, if the air inside the atrial board will give a very high impedance after device uh, implantation. If the air inside the air board. So we should put the screw inside the, the, the air board before we put the lead. Then we put the lead, we put the screw first, then we put the lead. Yeah, in order to put the the effect low, but then the doctor literal lead for the atrial board. بعدين نربط يعني ما نحطش الاتريال ليد زي ما بنعمل وبعدين نحط المسكون لو if the air inside the atrial board it will give a high impedance post operative. Not to this tracing but the, the tracing before that. Here it is not that this, the air is in the set screw but it is around it is the around, lead wow. and around the battery itself. Because it is subcutaneous ICD. Yeah, yeah. So, so for this tracing uh, what you said doesn't apply. It's not about the lead uh, having air around it in, at the set screw, but uh, alternatively, it's air around the pocket of the pacemaker itself, of, of the device. You understand that? Yes. So it's not air inside the set screw. Yes. Uh, air inside the set screw was the, the previous one, not this one. Yeah. So that's not to confuse the, air the audience. Inside yeah. the, the, the screw will give a high impedance, but air uh, outside, like this case, will give a lot of signals. Uh, yeah, you, you, it, it should, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it will give an artifact or a noise, like the previous example, without an impedance rise, okay? So it, it, for an impedance rise to, to, to be, usually you have to, to have the, the lead or, or put the way out of the connector, okay? but if it's just some air, so the impedance will be in the normal range again, okay? okay. But again, I have to emphasize that it's it's again uh, best practice uh, also for with the transvenous devices. If you follow the best practices, you can with a high percentage you can avoid these uh, complications. Because again, if you put the screwdriver first, then insert the lead, then the air can come out uh, through the hole where the screwdriver is. So that's why we always recommend to put the screwdriver first into the header, then the lead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, nowadays it's not recommended to put any oil or anything there. At least I, I've never seen that. But <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, could be. Could be. I, I didn't hear about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and one more thing uh, regarding this. 
it's even more important with the current devices when you have DF4 and IS4 connectors. Because just think about it, that uh, if you have a DF4 uh, lead end or IS4, it's a bigger diameter. So if you insert a DF4 or IS4 lead into the header and you don't put the set screw first, uh, the screwdriver first into the set screw, then you can have even more air into the header. So just again, please pay attention to that small but important step. So let's see the next one. We are back uh, to the transvenous uh, ICDs. Uh, so here the question is, uh, which behavior can be observed? Is it no therapy due to atrial rate is unstable? or there is no therapy due to morphology change, or the first ATP is ineffective, second ATP is effective, or no therapy due to capacitor charge malfunction, or no therapy due to rate slowing down. Any guess? Here? I recommend you to look at, of course, the EGMs and also the markers, what you can see, the marker panel. There's one guess for number five. Any five? Any other? Two? So can we reveal two? Okay, so let's see what is the right answer. The right answer was five no therapy due to rate slowing down. <clears throat> so what are the things that you can observe here? The first one is circled by blue. Here it says V episode. So if you remember from the, from the very beginning, uh, the device declared it as an episode because the device saw enough fast beats which fell into the V programmed VT zone. So the device declared V episode, ventricular episode. And then also the duration elapsed. You can see that the arrhythmia or the fast rhythm is still going on and the device uh, made uh, the detection. So ventricular arrhythmia was detected and the charging of the capacitor started here. It says charging. But then you can see that uh, after the device uh, started charging, the rhythm simply slowed down below the zone, below the VT zone. So therefore the device didn't deliver therapy. And here you can see the marker divert. So the charge is ended and the therapy was diverted. Is it clear or? Okay. It's purple segment, but are the, yes, the device, I cannot see the device annotation. And the purple, yes. Uh, under the purple, you can see, can't see it either. So it's a uh, <clears throat> V. So here you can see uh, the last one here is uh, VT, yes, then yes. V pace, V pace, V pace. Uh, this one is V sense. Sorry, this is V sense. Is it what you asked? Or so you can see that the rhythm slowed down. Of course, the device, like I think the same with every other company. Uh, the device, once it starts charging the capacitor, it will keep looking because it has to see if the arrhythmia is still going on. And before delivering the uh, therapy, at least our device is always rechecked for the last time. And if the arrhythmia is still there, of course, there the criteria are very strict. So the device has to see, uh, if not mistaken, only two out of the last three beats uh, falling into the fast uh, 
fast uh, rhythm, uh, then the device will deliver uh, the therapy. If the rhythm slows down in the meanwhile during charging, then of course it, it shouldn't deliver the therapy. I think you had a question. I don't fully understand the difference between uh, the ventricular episode declared and then the following one, uh, duration. Exactly, it's a duration. So uh, I showed you in the very beginning that uh, the device has to see uh, eight out of 10 fast beats, in this case, falling into the VT, VT zone. So there the device says, hey, something is going on. So it's an kind of alert for the device. Uh, a V episode uh, is declared. So the device says or sees that there is a ventricular episode that started. But the device has to see it for a certain time uh, because especially we know from uh, from medit RIT study, uh, if you if you are familiar with the medit RIT study, that uh, a big percentage of arrhythmias uh, self terminate. So the device has to see it ongoing for a certain amount of time, which is programmable. So in this case, I don't know what was the program we could calculate. Maybe it's how many boxes? Maybe one two seconds. Uh, so you can you can uh, set that in the programming. And the device has to see uh, for that certain time, and that's uh, called the duration. So this is what you can see in the programmer as marked duration. So if if the duration is satisfied and the rhythm is still fast during that period, and if you remember, I told you that during the duration, the device has to see only six out of 10 fast beats. So it's a bit more aggressive. So it has to see less fast beats to say, that detection was done. So we detect is when the duration is fulfilled, then the device will start charging. So that's the signal for the device that, okay, I have a, a ventricular arrhythmia, it's running for enough time, so now I have to do something. So the device starts charging the capacitors, then of course it will keep looking, because for example, in this case, you see that the, the rhythm slowed down after the detection was done. So then the device will not deliver therapy. No, in the uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Of course. So uh, also the in the in the VF zone, it has to go for a certain time because if for I don't know I don't know if it happens, but if there's a VF and it does it ever self terminate a VF, I'm not sure. But uh, if it's it also needs a certain amount of time. Of course, in the VF zone, uh, there's less time because that's the most uh, dangerous uh, rhythm. So then the device has less time uh, to, to make the decision. Yeah, but as I told you before, so the device starts charging and before delivering the therapy, the device again looks back and checks if the arrhythmia is still there. So it's another safety check uh, to not deliver a therapy when it's not necessary. Did I answer your question? Okay. So let's see the next one. The next one is again a transvenous device. So again, you can make your guess. There are five different answers. So the question is, uh, is it an intermittent atrial undersensing or an intermittent ventricular undersensing or intermittent ventricular oversensing? or there's an unsuccessful ATP delivery, or is it a normal ICD behavior? If you can't see something, please let me know, then I'm happy to read out the markers. So in the marker channels, if you don't see them or if you cannot read them, there are VF, 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 VS, 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 then VF, VF, VF markers. So in the beginning, there are VF markers, at the end, VF markers, and in the middle part, uh, there are ventricular sense markers. So what, what do you think? And also, I would like to draw your attention to the top of the strip. So here you can see that the first one is uh, the lead two, the second one is the ventricular EGM, the middle one, and the last one is the shock EGM. <clears throat> Yeah, we will see. So what is, what, what is the right answer? What do you think? 
number two, intermittent ventricular undersensing. Two, number two. Two. Okay, so let's see. Correct, you were correct. So this is intermittent, intermittent ventricular undersensing. And here you can see in, in blue, as I, I highlighted already, that there you can see uh, VF markers in the beginning and at the end of the strip. So there the device properly sees VF, although you can see, uh, you can see on the EGMs uh, that the arrhythmia is still going on. So there is no change. Uh, but here you have uh, undersensing, ventricular undersensing, because the device only sees uh, the bigger amplitude uh, events and undersenses uh, the VF. <clears throat> so there is appropriate VF sensing at the beginning and at the end of the strip. And uh, in the middle, every second beat is dropped, so not uh, sensed by the device. So this is undersensing. <clears throat> Is it clear or? Uh, the next slide is just a quick summary about how the sensing uh, works in, in, uh, in our devices. So you may know that there are two different type of uh, sensing. The first one is the uh, sensitivity, which can be programmed in some of the devices, but it's not used uh, in uh, ICDs because it has some, uh, some disadvantages. Because, for example, as you can see, if you have uh, some signals that are under the sensitivity threshold, then the device will uh, not see them. <clears throat> and on the contrary, uh, all, all Boston high voltage devices, the sensitivity that is used by the device is called AGC or automatic gain control. And it cannot be changed. So all our techie devices work uh, per this uh, scheme and <clears throat> please don't do, don't look into the details because it's a complex process done by the device just please remember that the device by every beat it starts decreasing uh, the sensitivity or becoming uh, more and more sensitive uh, and it's done in this fashion so the, the the message here is that it's not a fixed sensitivity but an ever-changing uh, sensitivity that is uh, used by our tech devices. Because we don't want to miss any, for example, low amplitude VF, or we don't want to see something that is near to, the, to an R wave to oversense. So with this, we can avoid uh, these undersensing or oversensing issues. Then another thing that is uh, available in our devices, and this is not programmable, so this is uh, working in the background, but uh, it's, I think it's uh, interesting for you to know. It's called the DNA or dynamic noise algorithm, and it only works with AGC or uh, automatic gain control. So they work together. And how it works is the following. The algorithm uh, analyzes the ventricular signal characteristics and is designed to minimize oversensing of noise without compromising appropriate sensing. The, use, uh, the algorithm uses the characteristics of a noise signal, frequency and energy to identify a signal as a noise. When noise is present, the DNA keeps uh, the sensitivity floor above the noise so that it doesn't oversense uh, the noise. And it's automatically active on all sensing channels. I told you it's not programmable, so it's always active. And it's working in the background, so you will not see it. Just the positive effects that uh, uh, noise is not uh, sensed by the device. So in this example, you can see that uh, this patient got uh, electroconvulsive therapy. And you can see uh, the EMI on the EGM. And one of you were asking, uh, with the, if you remember with the previous example, that how do we know if it's an EMI or, uh, for example, air entrapment? So if you remember that picture, and if you look at this picture, you can see that an EMI is usually much more, uh, much faster and uh, different in, in uh, morphology. So this is a typical uh, EMI, uh, but it's not sensed by uh, the device, luckily, because the DNA algorithm is working in the background. 
so you can see in the marker channel uh, that all all uh, sinus beats are marked as ventricular sense and the noise is not uh, sensed by the device. Of course, uh, this algorithm will not make uh, our devices immune from all uh, uh, from sensing all noise. So sometimes, if uh, the noise has such uh, nature or such uh, frequency, it can still be sensed uh, by the device because, of course, the sensitivity can sensitivity cannot be switched off. So we need to see what the device has to see. So in some cases, EMI still could be uh, detected by the device. This is the last slide from the, the ICD part, and I know we are, I see that we are far beyond time. So uh, I have another slide like about uh, CRTs. I don't know if we should start with those or we still have 10 minutes. So we can jump into that. And, and when you say that enough, then. Okay, because after that, I think we still have 15 minutes for the SICD part. At least I was asked to present some of the latest clinical data about SICD. Sorry, it's up to you if you if you wish. Yeah, yeah, I think okay. that would be okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, just one thing to highlight uh, here to all of you: <clears throat> uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Boston devices, uh, please uh, uh, you can simply Google, make a Google search for Educare. Just please make sure that you select the European or the EMEA uh, website, which ends with EU because there's also an American version, but please don't register on the American, but on the EMEA version. So you can just uh, type in Google Educare Boston Scientific. It's an online training platform where you can find full curricula. For example, if you have fellows, uh, students, you can simply enroll them. It's free, it's very easy to use, and they can go through all the pacing curricula, the high voltage curricula. You can find everything about SICD implant videos, cadaver trainings, really everything. So I highly recommend you to, to register and use it uh, once you registered. And for example, one very useful material is our device feature compendium in which we describe in a nutshell, of course, all our features and algorithms. So if you ever have any concerns or questions, it's a very good tool to uh, look things up. So you can also, it's a PDF. If you register on Educare and you create an account, it takes two minutes. Uh, you can download this PDF and it's, it's a very useful tool for you or for your fellows uh, or students. All right, so we agreed to go to the SICD. I will try to make it uh, quick. Uh, I prepared uh, two presentations. The first one is about uh, the Praetorian and the Untouched study, which are relatively new uh, clinical data from the SICD. These were published in 2020. Are you familiar with these studies? Okay, then just a quick summary. And I also have a presentation about uh, the ATLAS trial, which is the latest uh, clinical data about uh, the SICD. So that's probably more interesting for you if you are not familiar with that. Yeah, so if I can have the Praetorian, no, can I, can you please? Yes, that one. Thank you. Okay, so just uh, very quickly and shortly. Uh, so uh, the Praetorian trial was uh, announced or the results were announced in 2020 at uh, the HRS Congress. And uh, just a short summary, uh, how it looked like. So uh, it's a prospective uh, randomized comparison of subcutaneous and transvenous implantable cardioverter defibrillator therapy. It's an, it was an investigator, well, it still is because it's still running uh, for an extended uh, follow-up time. Uh, it's an investigator-sponsored research. It means that uh, Dr. Knops in Amsterdam developed and his team developed the protocol and they had the, the hypothesis and the idea of the whole study and they were running the study. So this is what an investigator-sponsored research means. And the hypothesis was that SICD is non-inferior to the transvenous ICD with respect to major ICD-related adverse events, such as inappropriate shocks, and ICD-related complications that require intervention, 
such as re lead related complications. So for those of you who are not completely familiar with the SICD, the, the biggest achievement and the main point of the SICD that we keep the whole vasculature and the heart untouched. So nothing goes into the vasculature. And I'm sure you all know, and you know better than me, how risky it is to implant a transvenous lead. Because if you have the most reliable transvenous lead, you can be sure that after 10 years, 15 years, you will have some issues even with the most reliable uh, leads. <clears throat> so therefore the SICD leaves all these uh, structures uh, in the human body untouched. So what were, the, uh, what were the key points of the study? This was the very first prospective randomized head-to-head -head clinical trial that compared uh, the perform uh, performance of the SICD and the transvenous ICD. Uh, more than 800 patients were uh, enrolled. Uh, they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion in the SICD and the transvenous ICD arm. And uh, the transient subsidies were allowed from uh, any manufacturers, and the patients uh, had to have indication for ICD, and they had to be eligible for the SICD. And 39 uh, sites participated in the su uh, study from six uh, different countries. So this is the, the study design. I already uh, described it uh, more or less. So the medium follow-up was uh, uh, 48 months for both uh, study arms. Uh, then the primary endpoint was non-inferiority uh, in regards of complications and inappropriate shocks, and the results were presented in 2020. And the, the point or the take-home message is that the primary outcome uh, or the primary uh, hypothesis was uh, confirmed. So uh, the study demonstrated non-inferiority. So the SICD had comparable performance to transvenous ICD but avoided all the serious complications, including infections that required lead extractions or lead complications. So it confirms uh, that the SICD can be a good choice for. So the outcome was uh, that uh, non inferiority was demonstrated uh, in the study. You can see I, I deleted most of the slides because there were many. So just really just to sum up everything, uh, here you can see the lead-related complications, and you see that uh, there was a highly significant difference between the SICD arm and the transvenous ICD arm when it comes to lead-related complications. I told you that uh, there was another study, the Untouch study, which was uh, also presented at, in the same year at, at HRS. It was also investigating uh, the emblem SICD in, uh, in well, it was investigating primary prevention patients with low EF. And uh, here's what they found uh, regarding the inappropriate shock rate. So here you can see in uh, the blue bars uh, are representing the inappropriate shock rates in studies with transvenous ICDs. And the purple bars are representing uh, the findings from the untouched study. It's important to mention here I'm not sure if you can see under the, the purple bars. The first one where you can see 3.1% uh, inappropriate shock rate. Uh, uh, that was uh, with, uh, with the older generation uh, uh, SICDs. And uh, with the SmartPass algorithm, which is a, a software development uh, in the SICD, which helps uh, filtering out uh, especially T waves. Uh, so we went from T wave oversensing you can see that in those devices, the inappropriate shock rate was down to 2.4%. So just as a conclusion, uh, the Praetorian study demonstrated that SICD had comparable performance uh, to the transvenous ICDs, uh, despite primarily including older SICD devices and implant techniques. I told you before that we learned a lot over the years how to properly implant an SICD. So we do it slightly differently what we did 10 years ago. And also uh, there were several software improvements in the SICD software architecture. So that also helped a lot uh, in avoiding, uh, for example, inappropriate shocks. So the SICD had significantly fewer lead related complications and it was uh, highly significant as you, as you can see. 
there were fewer serious infections uh, requiring uh, extractions. And there is a trend in fewer overall complications. And it's likely to be uh, significantly lower at eight years in the Praetorian XL study. So I told you that uh, the follow-up is uh, still ongoing. So there will be a Praetorian XL study uh, published after uh, eight years of uh, follow-up. And the untouched uh, study, which was another one, demonstrated patients with the emblem MRI with smart pass, uh, with the smart pass algorithm that they had a 2.4% uh, rate of inappropriate shocks at one year. Uh, which is uh, as low or even lower than some uh, transvenous uh, in, in some transvenous device studies. So I think that was all about uh, the Praetorian and the Antar study. And there's, uh, if we have, no, uh, maybe three minutes uh, just about the Atlas. Uh, just very quickly, I just wanted to show you because that's the, uh, the latest that was uh, presented last year. If we can get that one. Yeah, so the, the ATLAS trial uh, was the first uh, trial that showed uh, superiority. So if you can remember, Praetorian was a non-inferiority study, but this showed superiority of the SICD when it comes to uh, complications. So it was, again, it was a, a prospective randomized controlled head-to-head -head trial. Again, an investigator-sponsored uh, investigator research. Uh, the patients were randomized into two arms again. So there were uh, 500 patients. They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion, uh, either to the SICD or the transvenous uh, ICD arm. And the primary safety outcome at six months was a composite of all perioperative lead-related complications that you can see listed here. And uh, just to make it very short, I will skip all these slides. <clears throat> so at the end, uh, the ATLAS result showed that in the SICD arm, there was 92% reduction uh, of the serious lead related in the serious lead related complications. So that's, I think that's very impressive. And uh, also uh, they saw in the study that the conversion efficacy was over 99% for both arms. And uh, maybe this is uh, also interesting uh, that uh, you can see that uh, inappropriate shocks due to atrial arrhythmias were 82% less likely for the SICD. So the SICD was doing much better when it comes to atrial arrhythmia discrimination than the transvenous ICDs. And um, the percentage of inappropriate shocks due to T-wave oversensing and EMI, uh, uh, there was uh, less likely in the transvenous ICD arm. But it's also important to mention that the primary cause of the inappropriate shocks for the SICD arm was T-wave oversending and EMI, but 80% of EMI was due to TENS T, E, and S units, uh, trans uh, electro, I can't recall the name, so uh, neuro, so help me please. <laughs> what is the ENS? It's a trans, uh, you know, it's a, a nerve stimulation. I can't remember the abbreviation, sorry for that. So 80% uh, of uh, those EMI events were uh, due to that. Yeah, and uh, just to sum up, uh, it's again about the Praetorian and the ATLAS study. So you can see that uh, in both studies, we saw uh, significant uh, and high percentage reduction in serious lead related complications in, in both studies, uh, which uh, favored uh, the FICD. And I think that's the end we can finish here and thank you for your attention we are very very thankful it was very nice and very educative uh, thank you very much we enjoyed thank, thank you, you. Much. it was my pleasure to be here with you thank you uh, <clears throat> thanks michi thanks uh, for this uh, informative presentation and uh, for flying all the way from budapest thank you thanks for boston scientific for uh, sharing uh, the scientific uh, content and also for sponsoring part of this meeting thank you so much Thank you.